Ms Kipenwetter thinks that the European Central Bank will deal with these tricky dilemmas. A uh, huge thank you to um, our co-organisers, uh, the EU delegation to the United Kingdom and the European Central Bank representation in London. Um, I'm only going to talk for one second more um, and then I'm going to hand over to the ambassador who's going to say a few words of welcome. The structure is going to be um, the EU's ambassador to the UK, Pedro Serrano, is going to introduce Mr Panetta, who will then speak for about 20 minutes. Um, and then Dame Diane Julius, uh, who's a distinguished fellow at Chatham House and a founder member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, um, is going to ask Ms. Panetta a couple of questions and chair a uh, Q&A. Uh, so that is it from me, and um, over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Chris John, and a big welcome to all of you, and of course, a big welcome to Mr. Panetta, who's our guest of honor uh, this morning, and I know that that has been very short. Uh, actually, I'm supposed to introduce Mr. Panetta, but I think he's much better known than I am, so I'll just say <laughs> I'm Pedro Serrano. Uh, I'm the new ambassador <laughs> of the European Union uh, in the United Kingdom. I'm very honored to be here, um, arriving at a moment where the UK and the European Union are facing common challenges, uh, common challenges in the financial uh, field, certainly with the huge energy uh, crisis that we lived uh, last year and, and the impact this has had on the financial uh, world uh, with uh, particularly inflation. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Panetta is going to enlighten us on, on uh, the steps that have been taken by the central bank, but also huge challenges in the field of security. And actually, these challenges are interlinked and show how the European Union, the United Kingdom need to work together to confront them uh, effectively. Uh, central bank, central bank is at the center of the European Union, is a key element of the architecture of the European Union. Uh, actually, here the EU delegation, we also host uh, an office of, of the central bank, uh, Guy Charles, uh, Marie, where are you? There you are, uh, who is the <laughs> representative of the central bank uh, here. But Mr. Panetta, uh, again, uh, 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 very familiar to London, you told me, uh, Fabio, you've been here uh, for, for, you've lived here five years, you have a PhD uh, from the uh, business, London Business School, you studied in the London School of Economics. Mr. Panetta has, is currently um, um, member of the ECB Executive Board. He's responsible at the ECB, among other things, uh, of, for the directorate in charge of infrastructure and payments, which include the digital euro. And I know that this digital currencies is, is quite a, an interesting thing right now with the Bank of England as well, uh, looking into, into how to uh, move in, into that field. So I'm, I'm sure that things that you could say there on, on EU and um, uh, Euro and then the, the bank, central bank's experience on and look uh, into this will be very, uh, very interesting for our audience here today. Um, Mr. Panetta is a strong advocate also for international and European uh, relations, which is uh, very relevant. He, of course, has held in the past very relevant positions as well as uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Italy, Banca d'Italia, uh, Italian uh, Insurance Supervisory Authority, and the Bank for International uh, Settlement. So we have a very qualified uh, speaker here today. I uh, don't want to take more of your time. I, we are welcome here to listen to you and then to have an interaction with you. Big welcome, Fabio, to this house. It's your house. And, uh, and uh, many thanks to all of you for attending uh, this uh, uh, meeting this morning. And over to you, Fabio. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And, uh, Thank you, uh, Pedro. I want to thank His Excellency Pedro Serrano, EU Ambassador in the UK for this fantastic hospitality. I also want to thank John Spengfield and the Center for European Reform for organizing this meeting. Uh, and uh, Guy Charles Marek, uh, Chief ECB Representative in the UK for co-organizing this. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, even though when you have these presentations, then you become uh, abruptly aware of how much time you have been working, how old you are. Because, you know, I did not even, you know, I was at LSE and I was telling somebody, I'm almost a founding member of the LSE, which one <laughs> of them. So uh, it, it's, it's good to be back in London. It's a great pleasure to be here. 
I will uh, discuss today uh, the way I see the uh, European economy and uh, monetary policy by the European Central Bank. I will keep my delivery as short as possible. I will commit not to speak more than uh, 20 minutes. But uh, my speech is much richer. There are many more data, numbers, figures. And uh, if after this uh, presentation you are still interested in uh, understanding fully my, my comments, you may want to, to download my speech from um, the EZB website. I get no money for this, so feel free, don't, <laughs> don't feel obliged. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. The en energy shock stemming from Russia's aggression against Ukraine has prolonged and aggravated a sequence of unprecedented uh, supply shocks. These shocks, combined with the reopening of the economy after the pandemic, have driven inflation in the euro area to persistently high levels. To prevent inflation from becoming entrenched, the European Central Bank tightened its monetary policy stance decisively. We needed to avert second round effects in the form of a de-anchoring of inflation expectations or a wage price spiral. To <coughs> Since July, we have increased rates by 300 basis points. We have also started to normalize our balance sheet, which has shrunk by about 1 trillion euros since its peak. And in March, we will start, next month, we will start reducing our asset purchase program holdings. With this pronounced tightening in place, however, we need to carefully reassess the medium term outlook for inflation and the risks surrounding it. The economic environment is now changing. Supply shocks have started to reverse. With energy and food commodity prices receding from their peaks last year and supply bottlenecks easing. We also face a formidable source of economic, formidable sources of economic and geopolitical uncertainty globally. And major central banks are tightening their monetary policy stance simultaneously. In this setting, I will argue that the European Central Bank should not unconditionally pre-commit to future policy moves. Instead, we need to calibrate our monetary policy in a way that is data-dependent, forward-looking, and adaptable to changing developments. This approach can be best implemented by providing clarity on our monetary policy reaction function and then being guided by that reaction function in our monetary policy decisions. We should respond to incoming information on the medium-term inflation outlook and the balance of risks surrounding it. With rates now moving into restrictive territory, it is the extent and the duration of monetary policy restriction that matters. By smoothing our policy rate hikes, that is, moving in small steps, we can ensure that we calibrate both elements, the extent and the duration of monetary policy, both elements more precisely in the light of the incoming information and our reaction function. This framework will allow us to return to our target. We have a 2% target for inflation without undue delay. But it will also allow us to do so at minimal cost to the economy and employment, reducing the risk that we tighten too much. The current uncertain economic environment makes forecasting inflation particularly challenging. The medium-term inflation outlook was revised substantially upwards in our staff projections last December. Headline inflation was projected to stand at 3.4% in 2024 before falling to 2% in late 2025. And core inflation was expected to remain above target throughout our horizon, <laughs> declining to 2.4%, I'm talking about core inflation, 2.4% on average by 2025, as shown in chart number one. The risks to this outlook were primarily on the upside. But key assumptions 
underpinning economic projections can, and they do indeed, change quickly. And risks have become more balanced. <clears throat> First and foremost, energy inflation has slowed more than projected in December. As a result, headline inflation in January was well below what we expected in December, driven by the energy component as shown in chart number two. If the drop in energy prices is sustained, headline inflation may fall below 3% towards the end of this year, 2023. This deceleration in headline inflation is particularly visible from indicators of inflation momentum, shown in chart number three. These indicators may be more informative than the usual year-on-year -year inflation rate when inflation is changing rapidly, because they capture the sudden changes in inflation rates. These indicators are also showing signs of deceleration in core inflation. Wholesale electricity and gas prices are currently lower than assumed in the December projections, pointing to a continued decline in energy inflation. <coughs> and wholesale energy prices will affect all inflation components as they remain the largest driver of both goods and services inflation, as you can see in chart number four. Core inflation has not yet been significantly affected by the fall in energy prices. This is not surprising, as energy typically has a gradual and indirect impact on the price of goods and services through changes in the cost of inputs. For example, the cost of offering goods will over time benefit from lower transportation costs. Similarly, the cost of providing hospitality services will benefit from lower heating costs and the cost of, production, of producing food will benefit from lower fertilizer costs. So that will be an effect from energy to core. It will take more time. <coughs> the speed at which lower energy prices will pass through to core inflation is uncertain. If lower energy prices strengthen consumer demand, the pass through could be slower as firms seize the opportunity to increase margins. At the same time, over the past year, we have seen more frequent price adjustments, as it is typical in phases of high inflation, which uh, these frequent price adjustments, which if applied also in response to lower input costs, could make downward price rigidities less binding. <coughs> but in any case, in the end, the direction of core inflation will eventually follow that of headline inflation, as it was the case on the way up. While we need to be cautious as energy prices are particularly volatile, recent developments in energy markets have made the risks surrounding the inflation outlook clearly more balanced relative to what they were only a month, two months ago. Fiscal measures also contribute to the uncertainty on the inflation outlook. One major factor behind the upward revision to the December inflation projections for 2024 and 2025 was the assessment made about the fiscal measures taken since 2022 to smooth the impact of the energy shock. The projections foresaw that these price-based measures, the measures introduced by governments, and their subsequent withdrawal would reduce inflation this year in 2023 and increase it in 2024 and 2025. So we have a smoothing effect. As a result of the government uh, uh, measures, in the, the increase in energy prices for uh, consumers and the effect on inflation was smoothed. Um, lower inflation in 2023, and then a compensation, higher inflation in 2024 and 2025. This delayed the moment at which inflation was projected to return to our 2% target and risked creating a highly inefficient interaction whereby fiscal measures trigger a contraction in monetary policy reaction because when uh, we have the bounce back in 2024 and 2025, there is a risk that this bounce uh, rebound could bring inflation from below to 
above 2%. And of course, we have a 2% target, and this might trigger a monetary policy reaction. This would be like giving with one hand and taking away with the other. That scenario, however, was surrounded by significant uncertainty. Indeed, some governments have announced that they may reduce spending on energy price breaks or move to more targeted income-based measures. Income-based measures do not affect energy prices, uh, retail energy prices. So they have less effect on inflation. They do not cause those undesirable oscillations in inflation that I just described. Moreover, falling energy prices are likely to imply that energy support measures will be less extensive than foreseen in the December projections. If uh, retail energy prices go down, there's no need to give support. So uh, the extent of the intervention by governments could be lower than foreseen in the projections. This is also contributing to the rebalancing of risks to inflation. Another factor that drove up our projections was wage growth. We are all, pay all paying a lot of attention to wage dynamics. As workers sought compensation for high inflation, we expected wages to accelerate. In the seven countries covered by the ECB's wage tracker, <coughs> recently concluded agreements signal that wage pressures are rising, as shown in chart number albeit remaining consistent with the December projection. So we see a, an acceleration in wages, but as that has already been factored in our projections. So the projections already take into account that possibility. So you should not add anything to our projections because of, of wage growth. But so far, there is, in spite of this acceleration in wages, there is no convincing evidence that inflation expectations are de-anchoring. Why is this important? Because uh, uh, the anchoring of inflation expectations is a necessary condition for a wage price spiral to take hold. Why do workers, uh, why might workers uh, uh, ask for um, higher, more, um, higher uh, wage growth? Because they could fear that in the future they would lose purchasing power just because inflation is too high. This is not happening. Inflation expectations are de anchored. This may be an explanation of why wages are uh, rising, but not uh, to the point that we can uh, you know, uh, consider that a wage, the start of a wage price spiral. But then, what is the motivation of the acceleration in wages that we are seeing? The upside movement in wages might reflect a one off rebalancing in the income distribution between workers and firms. In fact, Workers have so far borne the brunt of the pooling tax. The increase in energy prices is a tensile trade tax that Putin has imposed on the European economy, suffering a large loss of real income while, on balance, firms' markups remained stable or even increased in some sectors. So wages are not increasing. Prices are increasing quite rapidly. There is a clear uh, shift of income distribution of, of income is shifting towards uh, capital and away from labor. Some rebalancing sooner or later uh, uh, will take place. We should not be too surprised. Um, other factors contribute to contain the inflationary pressures generated by wages. For example, lower energy prices limit workers' loss of real income, thereby containing their incentive to seek compensation through higher wages. And lower energy bills reduce input costs, allowing firms to better absorb wage increases without having to raise prices in response. All in all, I consider the risk associated with wage dynamics broadly unchanged compared with the December projections. Risks to the growth outlook are also changing. The same supply shocks that are rebalancing the risks to inflation are also rebalancing the risks to growth. Since December, economic activity and labor markets have proven more resilient than expected. And the outlook may improve further as lower energy prices support the economy and economic confidence in the context of 
robust job growth. That could reuse the downside pressure on the prices of <coughs> core goods and services. These positive developments could be partly counterbalanced by the tightening of credit conditions we have seen in recent months. There is also high uncertainty surrounding the international environment. Global demand and supply remain very difficult to predict. So how should monetary policy respond to this evolving, highly uncertain environment? Monetary policy has already made a sizable adjustment, and we now face inflation uncertainty in both directions. In such circumstances, a data-dependent approach to calibrating monetary policy is preferable since it enables us to react nimbly to the incoming data. And it gives us enough time to see how our decisions affect the wider economy. Very early evidence suggests that bank lending rates are increasing more quickly than in previous hiking cycles, in line with the steeper increase in policy rates. Lending to firms and households is also decelerating very rapidly, as you see in chart number seven. But given the long lags with which monetary policy is transmitted to the real economy, most of the effects of our tightening are still ahead of us. This means, for example, that the current adjustment in the banking market involving higher lending rates as well as tighter credit standards and lower demand for loans to firms and households as shown in charts number eight and number nine, will likely compress consumption and investment in the coming months. In the light of this, we increasingly need to consider the risk of over-tightening. Even if subsequently corrected, such over-tightening would be very costly for the euro area economy, given its low flexibility. A data-dependent approach is a prerequisite to avoid this risk. But for such a data-dependent approach to be effective and avoid exacerbating uncertainty, we need to provide investors with a framework for how we evaluate and respond to the incoming information. In other words, we need to clarify the reaction function of our monetary policy. In line with our price stability mandate, our reaction function is informed by the inflation outlook as well as the risks surrounding this outlook. A proper understanding of this reaction function can benefit from two important clarifications. The first is what will contribute to determining our reaction, that is, the set of factors that will affect inflation the most at our medium-term policy horizon. At the global level, currently the most significant of these factors are energy prices, simply because sustained lower energy prices are crucial for inflationary pressures to unwind. As for the domestic economy, a key factor in the coming months will be how rapidly lower energy prices and the associated lower cost pressures for firms are passed on to retail prices. In this respect, we need to carefully, to carefully monitor markups and wage growth, which could push in the opposite direction. For wages, we need to distinguish one-off adjustments from self-sustaining wage price generalized rises. Conditions in the credit market are also an important consideration, and I have just explained why this is the case. Second, we need to clarify how we should react to new information. Last year, the need to normalize monetary policy quickly from a very accommodative, uh, policy rates were negative, very accommodative starting point, placed emphasis on the pace of rate hikes. We wanted to front load because monetary conditions were clearly out of line with the inflation outlook. But now that we have made a major policy adjustment, the extent and the duration of restriction have become increasingly relevant. By smoothing our policy rate hikes, that is moving in small steps, we can ensure that we calibrate both elements, extent and duration of restrictions, both elements more precisely, remaining truly data dependent and avoiding 
mistakes, which are always possible, unlikely, but possible. This means that we would need to act in a non-mechanical way, keeping a genuine forward-looking approach. We also need to ensure consistency across our tools. It is natural to normalize the size of the balance sheet in a tightening phase, thereby making it push in the same direction as our interest rate policy. So we are hiking. It is obvious that we have to shrink the balance sheet. But the pace of normalization should be gradual and prudent, with rates remaining the key instrument to steer our monetary policy stance. It is hard, to put it mildly, to assess ahead of time how a contraction of our balance sheet will affect bond markets and financial stability, especially if it happens in conjunction with an abrupt change in interest rates. What we do know is that we must preserve the singleness of our monetary policy by ensuring that our policy impulse is transmitted smoothly across all euro area countries. And there are three lines of defense here. First, a measured, proportionate approach to hikes and balance sheet normalization. Second, the flexibility embedded in our investments under the pandemic emergency purchase program. And third, the transmission protection instrument. So let me conclude. As policy rates move more firmly into restrictive territory and the energy shocks and shock abates, the risks to the inflation outlook have become more balanced. In this environment, a data-dependent calibration of monetary policy, firmly rooted in a clear reaction function, offers the best way forward. And by smoothing our policy moves, we can ensure that their cost to the economy is minimal. This doesn't mean that we will not be resolute in the fight against inflation. It means being resolute in the right direction. What we do not want is to drive like crazy at night with our headlines turned off, as Italian singer Lucio Battisti, who would have been 80 years old uh, uh, precisely these days, once put it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank that was a very comprehensive speech, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Panetta has actually given us a, a very good clue, more than a clue, into the reaction function of, of the ECB. So you fulfilled one of your, um, you. your objectives, and I think it's been interesting for all of us. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask a couple of questions to, uh, to get us started, and then turn it over to all of you uh, in the audience. We have about, um, about 45 minutes in total, so plenty of time to to uh, tease out either things that came out of the speech or other things on your mind uh, to, uh, to talk to Mr. Panetta about. I think one of the phrases that struck me and that I'd like to start off with a question, and I hope I'm quoting you exactly, um, was that rates are now moving into restrictive territory. Uh, this idea of restrictive territory uh, and uh, normal rates is something that we economists um, have as part of our vocabulary without being able to measure things as well as we would like to, of course. But I think clearly at the, at the short end, um, rates are 2.5% and inflation is 9.2 or something like that uh, in, the, in the zone as a, as a whole. So if one just looked at the immediate uh, situation, rates are clearly not in restrictive territory. Uh, they're in fact negative by quite a large, uh, lar large amount. Now, of course, uh, monetary policy does operate with a lag, so that is not the best or, or maybe even an, an appropriate measure of whether rates are indeed already uh, near restrictive territory. And as uh, you probably heard in the US, Jay Powell has said that he thinks the measure is positive real rates over the yield curve, that is into the future. Uh, how, if, uh, if I may ask, how, how do you or your colleagues define the idea of restriction and where rates pass the neutral point and go from accommodative into restrictive? Uh, thank you uh, for this question, which I think is a fundamental one. 
how do we judge uh, the level of interest rates? Are they restrictive or are they not? Uh, if I were an academic, I would tell you that estimates of the natural rate is lower, but I'm not an academic, so I will not use that easy way out. <laughs> uh, my answer would be that first, um, air rates are indeed uh, um, positive. If you take into account not exposed inflation, but exempt inflation, expected inflation. Expected inflation in the euro area is firmly anchored at 2%. So um, if you are now deciding whether you should take a loan or not, you are interested in the real cost in the life of the loan, not about uh, you know, inflation uh, in the previous 12 months. If you look uh, to that measure of real rates, real rates are already positive along the <coughs> yield curve. Expected inflation is around 2%. Um, uh, short-term yields, the, our policy rates are two and a half, that will be uh, very soon three percent, so we are already in uh, uh, positive territory, and there is, there is a risk premium on <coughs> the yields, so the real rate is even slightly higher. But then I would also consider another metric, given that I don't know what the natural rate is, uh, uh, and I have a mandate, which is uh, price stability, and the definition of price stability for the governing council of the European Central Bank is two percent in the medium term, then I look at our projections. In our projections in December, which I argued may have considered a, a, you know, an environment which is now already old because things are changing. In December, our projections would suggest <coughs> that inflation will be at 2% at mid 2025. <coughs> Given that the, the policy horizon uh, of a central bank, depending on the, it's an empirical issue, depending on the, the, the transmission uh, lags, is from one and a half to years, we are about uh, at the level in which we are by and large in line with the level of interest rates we would like to have to bring inflation back to 2% over our policy horizon. So I'm not saying that we are already restrictive and uh, in you know, passing this judgment, I think I will make reference to the uh, famous contribution that you know, uh, Hotry, the famous economist of the 1930s uh, uh, did that monetary policy is to some extent at least an art. So my uh, hunch is that we are getting into restrictive territory. And um, if I believe the projections at face value, we should be at 2% by mid-2025. So um, given the environment, given the existing risks, I, why might uh, move even more, as the President mentioned yesterday, I think that could be justified on many uh, dimensions, but it is a fact to me that we are getting now close to restrictive. Right. Let me just ask one follow-up question, which I probably should know the answer to, but I'll ask anyway. Do do um, in, uh, in your projections, because you, you rightly point out that a lot of the judgment about restrictive or not is based on the projection of what happens to inflation over, over the, uh, the next couple of years. In that projection, are you using market interest rates, or what interest rate is in that? The, the, the tax structure, yeah. yeah. Um, the, I made reference to projections because it's a, you know, it's a benchmark. Yeah. It is not that our projections uh, constrain us in any way. The Governing Council does uh, uh, um, uh, his, its own uh, assessment of uh, uh, the real economy, of uh, financial conditions, of in the inflation outlook, and then we take a decision. It was just convenient for the, you know, the purpose of making this presentation to use a benchmark which is uh, available, which is uh, internally consistent, which provides an internally consistent uh, view of how the economy might evolve in the next three years. But of course, that's one reference. Then uh, if you look at uh, market expectations on inflation, they suggest that inflation might be lower in the next couple of years. Then uh, foreseen in our projections. The European Commission has just released uh, its own projections. They are even more optimistic. That, uh, I'm not saying that we should claim victory. Inflation is still a big risk. Wages, there are a number of uh, reasons why we might want to be prudent for quite some time. But there are now, unlike in the past, uh, reasons why we may be less worried. So I'm anxious, anxiously optimistic. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we're all certainly optimistic, exactly. but maybe different uh, levels of that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, right at the end of, of your presentation, you mentioned the TPI, the Transmission Protection Instrument. There's certainly a lot of market interest in the uh, fragmentation 
risk, uh, the risk that as ECB rates go up, those economies within the uh, euro area who are strong will see a small increase in, in their cost of borrowing. Those that are uh, fiscally weaker, which might be Italy or Spain, um, would see a larger increase in, in their borrowing, and that itself uh, can cause fiscal and therefore growth, growth issues. Uh, I think the, I guess the question really is, can you say something a little bit more uh, than that last phrase about either the, the trigger points for the use of the TPI or whether if it is used, when it is used, uh, there would be sterilization of, uh, of its effects? No, I will not be more precise. But uh, <clears throat> I think that the announcement of the TPI has been credible and very useful. When we announced the TPI, we made very clear that this was not uh, a way to cap interest rates in normal conditions. This was a way that we uh, have um, a, a tool that we have established in order to be able to hike monetary policy uh, by having a second line of defense. And the idea was that being credible, we can use it. Uh, on top of this, we are seeing different conditions in uh, uh, financial markets than many would have feared only a few months ago. There were concerns that in some countries there could be uh, fiscal uh, profligacy, <coughs> which was not the case. Uh, the country which was discussed the most was clearly Italy. But then, as a matter of fact, the new Italian government is not uh, um, implementing um, um, unwise uh, policies from the fiscal viewpoint that many would have feared. So I think that uh, the, the TPI is, as I mentioned, our third line of defense because first we must be measured, we must implement a gradual, uh, responsible policy to bring inflation uh, down to 2% as uh, quickly as possible, but not <laughs> quicker than that. Uh, then we have already flexibility which is embedded in our uh, reinvestment policy for the PEPP. The PEPP is the pandemic program where we can deviate from the capital keys if necessary to avoid segmentation in the financial market that could make our monetary policy implementation more difficult and this is not the case. Then we have a third line of defense <coughs> in case we have um, 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 developments in bond markets that are unrelated to fundamentals then given that we have to implement our monetary policy in all euro area countries throughout the euro area, then uh, there could be a decision by the governing council, which is not going to be an automatic decision, must be um, justifiable on many grounds. It must be necessary from a monetary policy viewpoint. But given that our announcement has been uh, credible, we don't need that instrument. And uh, our we have tightened at quite an aggressive pace. I, this is the most aggressive tightening cycle of the ECB ever, 300 basis points uh, in March. Um, I'm not discussing everything, uh, the president said this yesterday in the European Parliament, so uh, 50 basis points is already priced in uh, market uh, prices. 300 basis points in six months is quite a lot. In spite of this, we see orderly conditions in bond markets, and this is also related to the credibility of our and monetary policy frameworks, which includes, but not as our first line of defense, the DPI. Thank you. Uh, yes, 300 basis points is a lot, but of course it was starting from an extremely low point. Uh, and, I, and I think the, the argumentation is whether all of our forecast models, Bank of England I can speak for as well, uh, is, is calibrated to a different environment where interest rates are much lower than they certainly have been in the past when we've had inflation rates at this level. And I guess maybe that, let me ask a, a final <coughs> question for me and then open it up. Hopefully you have a few questions out there as well. Uh, I think the, when you said moving in small steps, uh, this kind of sent a shiver down my spine because, not, not that I think it's a bad idea, when one is uncertain, one should usually take small steps rather than large ones, uh, but because I can remember the days uh, of Arthur Burns, uh, not personally, but I did study them, uh, yeah. back in the 70s when uh, we all faced similar sorts of oil price shocks, although there were two rounds of them then. We might, might have another round, I don't know. And 
he moved in small steps. Uh, and later in a speech after he had left office uh, in 78 or 79, he, he left office, he, he admitted it was with hindsight being too timid and that indeed it had allowed inflation to accelerate through the wage, wage channel and the expectations channel uh, in a way which it took Paul Volcker a few years later uh, to really bring inflation back under control and raising interest rates, I think, to 18, 20% at like one point. I have no expectation at all that we're anywhere near that. But it was certainly a cautionary tale that sometimes being too cautious can itself cause real problems. So I suppose my, my question is, uh, do you keep this history in the back of your mind too? Uh, and what might cause you and your colleagues to change your mind about small steps if, uh, if indeed a change of mind becomes necessary? Uh, thank you very much because you give me the opportunity to clarify better something that I wanted to express in my initial comments. To move in small steps doesn't mean to move less. The error of Mike Burns was that he stopped and he should have uh, tightened more. I'm not saying that we should stop tightening. I'm saying that given that the uncertainty we face is certainly higher than in the past, but uh, high in absolute terms, uh, we may want to, to understand the evolution of the economy bec before taking decisive steps. Uh, as I said um, in, my, in my comment, it doesn't mean we will not be resolute in the fight against inflation. It means that we will be resolute in the right direction. So Burns was not in going in the right direction. He stopped. Should have continued. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that uh, we face so much uncertainty in uh, uh, both directions that uh, I would consider unwise to move and to move very fast without being sure that you are moving in the right direction. If you are very fast and you go in the right direction, you are very good. If you take the wrong direction, then you have a problem. <laughs> so I'm just saying that uh, we should take some time to consider if now in the past, even though I'm considered by some more dovish than others, I did not object to hiking because it was clear that the direction of, of travel was the right one. But now, um, I think inflation could move in uh, both directions. We might see if don't have, you know, experience uh, additional shocks, a fast disinflation, the same way we saw a fast increase in inflation. So is that going to be the case? I don't know, because I really think that we are facing very high uncertainty. In this case, you want to, to think not once, twice, before moving in one or the other direction. I did not say we should stop. I say, let's take some time to understand the evolution of the economy better. Okay, and let me open it up to the, to the floor. Uh, perhaps I could ask you just to give us your name and if it's relevant where, where you're from, uh, and then ask your question. Go ahead. Oh, there's a mic right behind you. And I guess I should just remind you, as I think perhaps John did, this, uh, this whole session is on the record. Yeah, thank you. Uh, David Marsh from OMFIF. I wanted to go into the TPI a bit, not to ask you about the uh, operating manual for this, but the principles, but also just more widely uh, the misadventures that we've had in the UK uh, in the last few months with the uh, dispossession of a chancellor and removal of the uh, PM U-turn in government policies, all the kind of things you come to expect from a, an unstable country. I just wonder whether this is something that uh, has uh, some influence on the ECB's thinking and also whether you think this has had some influence on Mrs. Maloney's government. Uh, Isabel Schnabel referred to this as a wake-up call uh, a few months ago, and specifically the TPI. Are there any kind of... Uh, ways that you look at what the Bank of England did in September and October, the time-limited nature, the fact it was done under strict conditions to try to um, limit moral hazard, uh, and the fact that it intruded into the political sphere. Do you see if there's any parallels between what the Bank of England did with this famous 13 days in October and what the ECB might do if the TPI ever did come into operation? No. That's my answer. I'm serious, that's my answer, no. <laughs> we did not take any inspiration from the UK uh, experience. I think the UK experience took inspiration from it. We did this months ago. <coughs> and uh, because we know that we are not a, a single uh, state, we are a monetary union, there may be uh, situations in which we have fragmentation. And if we have fragmentation, we still have to do monetary policy. 
So it was not related to any individual uh, country, to any individual government. It was a monetary policy decision that in a monetary union you implement differently than in other jurisdictions. And certainly the TPI which was issued when? In uh, June, May, July last year did not take any lesson from the experience of the UK in uh, October for chronological reasons. Yeah, no, the question is whether if you did use it, whether you would look at the British experience. You haven't decided how to use I, it yet. I will not start speculating on the TPA. <laughs> Very wise. Uh, yes, um, there are a couple of gentlemen beside each other. Maybe you could take the mic. And again, if you could tell us who you are. Thank you. Chris Crow from Capula. Um, thank you, Mr. Panetta, for this very interesting speech. One thing that struck me was you talked about the d need to differentiate between one-off wage adjustments and ongoing increases in wages. I was just wondering how you would do that in, in real time. That, that is where we have to exercise the art of central banking. But um, <clears throat> uh, I think the f I, I guess that the first step to differentiate is to understand the motivations behind uh, the wage rises we are seeing. Um, de facto, uh, wages are rising, but they are not asking full compensation for the increase in inflation. Uh, that means that, at least to some extent, unions, workers, are looking through the inflation episode we are going through. And uh, they do realize and they are also including in wage negotiations one of payments, they do realize that if somebody imposes, manages to impose a tax on the European economy, <coughs> that tax has to be, if it is a tax, has to be split about the, you know, between the um, uh, two factors of production, capital and labor. And so they cannot claim 100% of the tax, so they seem to behave uh, consistently with what I consider the nature of the inflation episode we are facing. Uh, you cannot, if you are a low uh, paid worker, you cannot uh, afford to pay the entire cost of the tax, you cannot afford the reduction of purchasing power by 10%, you must have some compensation. When the economy improves, you have more bargaining power, you can claim more of the tax than in the past, but in a rational setting, you don't claim 100% because you know that in the end that will start a wage price spiral. And uh, I think that what we are seeing is consistent, uh, of course, uh, with the more adverse scenarios, but it's also consistent with a more rational development, interaction between wages and uh, between the workers and the uh, employers. So um, also, uh, in order to have a wage price spiral, you need the, the basic condition for that. Inflation expectations should be de-anchored because either the workers go bananas and they start asking huge wage increases, which I don't expect, or there could be a rational motivation, that is, I expect inflation to be much higher, I expect to have, unless I get a wage increase that is of a comparable magnitude, I expect to suffer a loss in uh, real income. Then I start ask, asking higher and higher wages. That could trigger a wage price spiral. But again, uh, we see that not only workers are only claiming only part of the tax. They, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, consumer expectation survey that we uh, uh, run in the euro area, expectations of consumers uh, in the long term are anchored. So I don't see the. I'm not saying. We, don't, we will not necessarily have a wage price spiral. I don't see the, the essential uh, elements that could induce me to conclude that we are seeing a wage price spiral. And also, uh, the most anxious commentators and policymakers do not uh, have the perception that we are seeing a wage price spiral. So I agree with you, it is difficult, especially in real time, and you must uh, you know, look carefully at numbers and to form a view. My view is that uh, what we are seeing is compatible with the rational interaction between uh, capital and labor, wages and profits. Profits are high, so now that profits are high, the economy is you know, uh, probably more resilient than many would have expected only a few weeks ago. Maybe workers will, will dare to ask more, but 
I, I don't think we are seeing a wage price spiral. This is, I, I, no, yes, yes, I understand nobody's uh, view. Could, could I just ask a small follow-up? Because I agree that certainly the wage, the wage risk is one of the big ones in, in forecasting infl inflation. Uh, wages are usually a lagging indicator. And uh, looking at your chart that uh, had that, it was clear that the acceleration has happened, uh, bringing wage growth up to somewhere near 5%. Uh, if it's a lagging indicator, and maybe it isn't in, in the Eurozone as a whole, but certainly uh, that's been the case here, uh, how can you be confident that today's level of, let's say, 5% um, is not just on a trajectory that's going further? You are absolutely right, but this is precisely the point I tried to make in my co initial comments. Uh, what we see is compatible with one interpretation, but it's also compatible with other interpretations. And this is what I call uncertainty, which can go in both directions. And this is what induces me to argue that the central bank should be prudent, act gradually, not to take one direction at full speed, because you might regret afterwards, and you're right, what we are seeing does not allow me to conclude that there is no wage price spiral. There is a risk. And um, uh, how this will evolve depends on a number of conditions, on the strength of the economy, uh, on participation, uh, on a number of factors that we monitor on a daily basis. And wages are still risk for the inflation outlook. But uh, what I said is that I don't see right now um, indications that could induce me to argue that we are seeing a wage price spiral. I don't, but I not, did not say, and I would not say that uh, I'm sure there will not be a wage price spiral. Risks are uh, in both directions. Again, let me emphasize this once more. It is possible. At the moment, it's not uh, the most likely scenario. It is possible, so that's why I gave my, my view that we should be prudent. Thank you. And the gentleman, yes, who has the mic. Hi, uh, Lorenzo Codogno, um, uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, two questions, two brief questions, if I may. The first one, you mentioned that uh, uh, balance sheet policy needs to be consistent with interest rate policy. Um, I suppose that uh, um, some point, uh, say mid-2023, uh, as uh, Marcus expects, uh, the, the ECB will reach the peak in interest rates. How do you see uh, the uh, balance sheet or quantitative tightening policy developing after that? The second question is very a little bit technical, let's say. Um, uh, we have seen some issues in terms of collateral availability in the past, and uh, I wonder whether this might be an argument in favor of um, a sort of reverse uh, repo facility the way the Fed does, or maybe some other initiatives to smooth or address the, the issue? <clears throat> Good try, and thank you, Lorenzo, for this question. Yeah. Uh, you know, it would be quite awkward if I travel from Frankfurt with all the difficulties of traveling yesterday. I come to London, I give a speech to argue that we should truly data dependent and not to give any indication of what we, we do two, three months from now. It would be quite awkward if I started to speculate what we would do in June and July. So I, and I also think it's totally inappropriate for a central banker to start speculating on actual policy uh, measures outside the proper uh, uh, setup, which is for me the governing council of the European Central Bank. I know that some do it. I really don't like it. I, I think it's inappropriate. I'm not going to, to get involved into, we will do this, I would like to do 50, 38, uh, 16 basis powers increase, we will tighten the balance sheet by one more trillion. I have my views, but uh, again, I'm not here to speculate on future policy and to disclose any spicy insight, also because I don't know, because of course I could answer you, that depends on what would be the inflation outlook then. If the inflation outlook would be totally, totally different from what it is now, if uh, energy prices will continue to go down, I would use the framework I just mentioned, the reaction function, to assess what would be my uh, view on our balance sheet policy. So I want to be consistent with what I said, not three years ago, but 20 minutes ago, and <laughs> avoid speculating on this. What I will do, I will tell you in three months, 
based on the numbers we will get in the meanwhile, based on the outlook for inflation, on the strength of the economy, on conditions, on bond markets. And I just don't know what those uh, dimensions, those elements will suggest me to do uh, June, July, you mentioned six, four, four months, five months from now. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, let's Bye. see, the lady in the front row? Uh, 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 Oh, the repo, sorry. Yes, did you want to say anything about that? Like above. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the lady here in the front, please. And, and then we'll go over there. Uh, Catherine Mann, uh, Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. Um, central banker to central banker of talk, course, you know. Of course. Um, you so, can tell her everything. <laughs> <laughs> only in private. Um, I'd like to explore the lags, the um, famous 18 to 24 month lags. Um, because in your picture, uh, chart seven, eight, and nine, you argued that the transmission mechanism from bank rate to the credit channel was actually very rapid. Um, on the other hand, you said we can't go very fast because the Euro, uh, European Union is, uh, Euro area is inflexible. Uh, so shouldn't I worry about that combination uh, as affecting 18 to 24 months and in which direction? Uh, fast, because of the credit channel, uh, slow, because of inflexibility, and inflexibility also could mean uh, duration above 2% extending a long time, in which case monetary policy would have to uh, perhaps uh, respond with a more forceful uh, direction. Thank you uh, very much for your question, which is uh, on a, a key element of our monetary policy. Um, first of all, the chart which I uh, have shown, uh, which is included with many others, mm -hmm. a small advert uh, of my speech, in, uh, in the uh, uh, full text, uh, indicates that the first step of the transmission channel uh, is already at work. That is the transmission to um, the credit market. Where this has already reached consumption and investment, I would doubt. Um, we, I don't know how uh, long the transmission mechanism uh, uh, is, uh, certainly longer than seven months. We started to hike, that's my hunch. We started to hike in July, yeah, we announced uh, uh, the end of our purchase plan, but the real action comes when we start hiking. Interest rates are a much powerful uh, instrument. And our first hike was in July. Uh, maybe that uh, the uh, lags are shorter because there's a lot of leverage in the economy, because uh, the, the, the uh, hiking cycle has been uh, very aggressive, but I would have doubt that the um, lag could be as short as seven, eight, nine months. So I see what is happening to inflation as being independent from our monetary policy. Our monetary policy is still lying ahead of us. Uh, second, on the inflexibility, it's uh, a comment on uh, the risk of over-tightening. We know from empirical evidence that the recovery times from a recession for the Euro area are much longer given the st structure, the la I call it lack of, lack of flexibility, very loose, but just to give you an idea in my speech, uh, the lags uh, that uh, in the Euro area um, uh, go from in the trough of the recession to the return to growth are much longer than in the US. So what my comment was, um, the cost that we are imposing because I, th I think that the, in the US, the Fed is much more confident that they can stimulate the economy back to growth if they do a mistake. Because the, the, the structure of the economy in the US is different. My concern <coughs> is that this is not going to be the case in the euro area and the cost of going too high, not just too quickly, but also too high, uh, could be higher in the euro area because of the, the way the economy is uh, uh, functioning. Uh, yeah, I, I think there are two similar, but not just the same concept. 
In the first case, I was trying to argue that the tightening we have already implemented um, has not reached the real economy. We see that the way it uh, will affect the economy could be um, stronger than in the past because the effect on the intermediate step of affecting um, uh, loan flows and uh, loan rates in the credit market uh, suggests that it is stronger, even though we never experienced such an aggressive tightening in the euro area. So comparing with previous cycles, it looks like it is stronger. So another reason why we should be prudent, because if we get uh, you know, a, a disinflationary pressure from the evolution of the global economy for energy markets, and then on top of that, we add a very aggressive tightening, which could be uh, more effective than in the past, given the leverage is higher, then, uh, then uh, uh, we should uh, uh, you know, assess very carefully the effects of our, of our uh, uh, policy measures. And then also on the level. Uh, of, uh, of the ex extent of the tightening and the level of, of uh, policy rates, I think that the cost for the economy could be, could be pretty high. Uh, a few more questions on this side, if you don't mind taking the mic over there. Uh, gentleman in the front row, and then there's a lady a couple rows back, and then this person. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Julian Callow from Rockos uh, Capital. Very interesting uh, to hear. Uh, your elaboration of the ECB uh, reaction function. And I'd like to uh, ask you a little bit more uh, about that. Um, uh, your chart nine um, was on the bank lending survey. Um, I think you had some very interesting charts there. I was looking at them on the, on the website. And uh, chart nine is very, very weak um, for uh, loan uh, conditions as expressed by bank loan officers. In fact, if, if you were to take a longer history of that and plot it against some demand variables, you'd find that that chart alone is signaling a very high chance of a bad recession uh, in the euro area. It's quite a good leading indicator. Um, so I'm wondering why we don't hear a bit more about this um, uh, from the governing council, um, because it seems to me that indeed, as you say, uh, that there is a very profound transmission that's come from this uh, very aggressive and rapid tightening by the ECB uh, via the monetary transmission channel. and. Uh, uh, we, we should therefore, I think, uh, definitely be very, um, very prudent here. Uh, but we, we don't seem to have so much focus, uh, not the laser-like focus, perhaps. Not, not, not the laser-like focus, perhaps, that um, we had on the money and credit aggregates during the first decade uh, of, the, of the ECB. Uh, so I'm interested if you can elaborate on that, please. Thank you. I see. I can see chart nine, but I'm not sure if anyone else can. If you can remember it. it, it oh no, it's all there. Okay. Um, chart nine is about the 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 attitude of loan officers from major uh, euro area banks on their uh, attitude in lending, and there is a tightening in lending standards, and also there is a perception that there is a reduction in the demand for credit, and we see that loan flows are decreasing very rapidly. You are absolutely right. The leading indicator properties of the BLS are uh, um, quite reliable. At least in the past, they have been reliable. And um, but, uh, I thank you very much. And thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have enough. Uh, I don't have many smart things to, to take note about. Even and our uh, king needs a new pen every now and then, <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I think, I guess that the answer to your question is that we have gone through a prolonged period of high inflation and many uh, would like to be reassured that we will bring inflation down to 2%. And uh, historical experiences of the past may have influenced the attitude. And, um, the transmission mechanism may have changed. My impression is it may have become stronger, more effective than in the past. But this is not uh, the view of all components of the governing council. And they understand that you should also take into consideration the fact that the euro area is um, a monetary union. And uh, inflation rates differ substantially from country to country. And uh, the viewpoint matters. In some countries, inflation is still uh, you know, around 20%. Uh, 
and uh, you know, seen from there, the inflation outlook might look different than uh, if your point of observation is in a different uh, area of the monetary union. So I guess that there is prudence on both sides. Some want to be prudent not to impose an excessive cost to the economy. Others want to be prudent because they want to be sure that we bring inflation down even if it might prove exposed costly. I think this is a good starting point to have a, a reasonable uh, uh, average view on what we should do uh, going forward with our monetary policy measures. Thank you. Uh, the lady in black. No, can you wait? Can no, you no, just wait, wait, for, the mic. Mic wait for the mic? Because for those who are watching us uh, on their screens, they need the mic. Thank you. Uh, I'm Silvia Ardagna from Barclays. So thank you very much for this uh, great presentation and for this event. So I have two uh, small questions. One, on the fiscal impact of the price cap measures. You were saying they were limiting inflation in 2023 and increasing inflation in 2024. If we have a sense of how much, and uh, now that the energy curve has shifted downward, how much uh, less of the bump we can have in 24. And the second on uh, a follow-up on wage growth, I think one way we could assess perhaps second round effects is by looking at what workers negotiate for the second year, right? In countries where they negotiate for multiple years. And if you have any um, assessment of uh, where are we running there in terms of wage growth for the second year of um, renegotiation. Thank you. On your first question, did we disclose these numbers? Yeah. Yes, okay. So our uh, assessment is that the fiscal measures which have been decided or announced by governments will uh, at the area at the level of the euro area uh, reduce inflation by around one percentage points in 20 have to reduce inflation by around one percentage point in 2022 and uh, by a bit less in 2023 and they uh, according to our uh, analysis in December would have caused a a rebound of 0.7 in uh, 2024 with carryover effects in 2025. So, the, uh, you know, let me say that the measures taken by governments are perfectly legitimate, especially when they were introduced. Why? Because governments were smoothing uh, um, income of consumers, and that is usually very useful. But of course, when you smooth and you reduce inflation, when it is very high from high, doesn't make us much different for us. But then if you increase inflation when it is low, when you make it less low, and less low means above 2%, that makes a difference. So what was rational when those measures were introduced may be less convenient if the environment changes. So if in uh, uh, 2022, when inflation was very high and rising, energy uh, prices were very high and rising. It was uh, convenient for consumers to have some smoothing, not to have the entire reduction of uh, purchasing power uh, in 2022 20, uh, and smooth it across time. Now it's less convenient. Why? Well, because inflation is falling and if prices are falling. And if, again, that's, let me repeat this. If you bring, give an example, inflation down from eight to seven, we would hike with eight, we would hike with seven. But if you bring inflation up from <coughs> 1.8 to 2.2, then may make a difference. We should look through, yeah, but there is a possibility, a non-zero non possibility that that might have an effect on, uh, and it's in the statement that has been issued by the governing council in the last meeting. Your second question, yes, absolutely. That's one indicator. The other is the payment of one-off payments, which imply that uh, workers expect a one-off uh, inflation increase. You, ask for a compensation, but not a permanent increase in wages. There are a number of indicators. And as I said, we are monitoring uh, um, wage negotiations. We have a wage tracks, tracker that uh, looks at individual wage contracts, uh, um, uh, new contracts, uh, different countries with different indicators uh, using different surveys. And we are monitoring very close in cost of <coughs> wages. And the assessment right now, my assessment is that we don't have a second round effect, but high risk. Uh, the gentleman in the front row. Uh, there's a mic just coming, I think. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Panetta. It was very interesting. Valentin Marino from Korea Agricole. And a question following up on uh, what has been uh, asked, really. And uh, something you've been discussing, I believe, last November, the energy transition in Europe and uh, the impact on inflation. Just in the context of today's presentation, what do you say the impact on policy would be, especially given the, uh, you mentioned the government measures to smooth the impact of inflation, which is, I guess, positive for consumption over the longer term, potentially positive for inflation, but also something you've mentioned uh, about the extent of investment expected to facilitate the energy transition. I think, believe you mentioned 500 billion per year or something. So I guess, uh, what would you say, would that mean that the ECB may, essentially ECB policy rates will have to stay high for longer, historically high, not necessarily higher? Or uh, would you say that it's uh, still inconclusive? Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't see the measures introduced by governments in 2022 and uh, still uh, rolled over uh, to a large extent in 2023 to be related to the energy transition. They are a response to the energy shock. So I, I would keep this separate. The energy transition, um, there are um, discussions on what will be the effect of climate change and the contrast to climate change <coughs> on inflation in the medium to long run. I have uh, myself given a speech in which I argue that the, the effect will depend on policy. The initial view, which I think is correct but incomplete, is that given that governments will force a transition away from fossil fuels, there will be less incentive for producers to invest in the production of fossil energy. This means there will be, a, a, in the transition, excess demand. This means that this would beat up uh, energy prices will get more inflation. But if this is the case, then I think we are doing the wrong thing. Because uh, if you go to the people, the consumers, and you tell them that the cause of the energy transition uh, is that we have higher inflation and uh, tighter policy for many years, then you don't get much support by the people. And without political support for those policies, you don't go very far. The other view, uh, is that uh, you should not look only at supply. Markets are done of supply and demand, so let's look at demand. And there are many reasons, including preferences, but not only preferences, uh, availability of uh, alternative uh, energy sources, <coughs> renewable sources, and technology is progressing very fast. The marginal cost of producing energy with solar uh, um, producing uh, you know, solar energy is estimated to be, you know, I don't want to make, uh, around one third of the marginal cost of producing energy with fossil uh, fuels. So if we invest in uh, alternative energy sources, in green renewable energy sources, then we can bring down, not up, the cost of energy. This means that inflation will do what uh, we uh, will introduce as an input in the functioning of energy markets with our policies. Um, in this respect, there is a, a lot of discussion at the international level on the IRA, whether this... I think we should thank our American friends for uh, pushing uh, Europe and the US into a discussion of how much to invest in green technology. Then we will find a solution which would be acceptable for all. But we are now discussing how and how much we should invest in green technologies, which also implies a production of additional uh, uh, clean energy. So um, in the medium term, my hunch is that uh, we will be rational. We'll, we'll be investing in the production of renewable, cheaper energy sources. And I do not expect this to build inflation up for a long time. I do not expect this to imply tighter policy. I hope this is not going to be the case, otherwise the political support, which, uh, again, is necessary to go in that direction, will not be huge, to put it mildly. Could, could I just uh, expand a little bit on, on the question, maybe, because I think this, it's an important one, because it thinks about the, the period after which we're through these shocks. Now, that may never come, come but if we think about um, your speech is mainly about the reaction to the energy price cri uh, crisis <coughs> and the and the pandemic bounce back. 
if, if we could focus a little bit on the medium term prospects in, uh, in the Euro area, it does seem to be the case that the investment demands will be higher, uh, and main, mainly public sector investment, but of course private as well, because of the energy transition costs initially, also because of additional defense spending, which several countries have, have promised to implement. Uh, and if, because interest rates are also a balancing factor between savings and investment, uh, it does seem to me that there is a case to be looked at, at least, that in order to control inflation, and given the fiscal impacts and transmission through to inflation, it may be necessary in this medium term new normal, if we ever get there, uh, to, have, to run the economy at a somewhat higher level of real interest rates. Uh, so that we would not be returning to the pre-pandemic period, um, but in order to keep the inflation target, we'd be looking at a higher level of real interest rates. It is possible. And the opposite is also possible, because these are supply-side policies that in the short run, they increase demand, they stimulate investment. Then if those policies are implemented well, we will have higher supply in the medium term. And uh, the net effect of that is at best unclear. But if our policies are implemented correctly, we uh, should not have an excess demand as a result. Take, take the case of the stimulus which was given by the US to their economy after the pandemic. Huge demand stimulus to, through transfers. Now they are following a different route. They are stimulating supply through the IRA, two different policies. In one case, they stimulated activity in the short run by you know, uh, also getting in, in return higher inflation. If the policies they are implementing now with the IRA are effective, they will stimulate supply. So they could have the opposite effects. So it depends on which policies, it's, it's not be taken for given that only demand will increase. There will be a very unbalanced situation. I, if we are, um, will be able to introduce and implement the right policies, uh, we will have an effect on supply, and the net effect of that will be. But also, you are talking about conjunctural factors, because in the end, the factors that are behind the, long, uh, the low for long, uh, productivity, demography, demand for safe, safe assets, those are structural factors that don't change uh, overnight. While those that you were mentioning are mostly conjunctural developments, it may be true that for some time you may need uh, uh, higher rates, but uh, in the long run, you will have more demand, more supply. What is the net effect? But overall, <coughs> the, the uh, underlying motivations of the low for long, of the, you know, the low level of interest rates which prevailed in the past, again, demography, productivity, um, limited supply and high demand for safe assets, I think they are still there. Like many things, it's a matter of lags and uh, where we are in the cycle. Uh, the lady over here, please. And this will have to be about the last question. So. Hi, Catherine Nice from Peach and Fixed Income. Um, maybe a, a relatively quick question given the time. Thank you so much. Uh, given the scale of the energy price uh, shock, a relative price shock that has hit the euro area, do you think that there is a case to be made to extend the horizon over which inflation is returned to, to target? Thank you. That's a very difficult question. I will try to be as rational as possible and not instinctive. Uh, um, we are in a very peculiar situation, as I said before. We are uh, now in a situation which we have been through persistently high inflation. And the risk of a de-anchoring or a risk that we will see the consequences of wages is very high. So if we were discussing the textbook uh, reaction to what we are seeing, and uh, you know, the fact that inflation, including in our own projections, will return to 2% by mid-25, indeed, we should extend the policy horizon. But that would be true in general, maybe less true right now, given what we have been through in the last 12, 18 months. Uh, we are taking a lot of comfort from the fact that inflation expectations are anchored. We cannot assume that they will be anchored forever. We are monitoring wages, and my, my, my 
view is that we don't see a wage price spiral. We cannot guarantee that we'll be true forever, that we'll remain uh, true forever. So we want to be careful on both sides. Maybe we should continue to pay attention to inflationary risks, maybe not, not to be imprudent, maybe we want to be gradual. But uh, the answer is complicated by the fact that we have gone through a period of persistently high inflation. So I did not give you a clear answer. This is precisely what I wanted. Yeah? <laughs> I think you actually have given us some clear answers, which is that uh, mo making monetary policy is an art as well as a science, and it's a matter of judgment. Uh, we've certainly benefited greatly from your you. explanation of the kind of analysis that uh, you and your colleagues go through and what it might mean for all of us. I'd like to thank everyone for coming at this early hour in the morning, uh, and particularly perhaps you will join me in thanking Mr. Panetta for such an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.